I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share some of our perspectives from our work in the UK. It is, as Kylie has suggested, absolutely part of our mission to share our learning. It's a public good. It's to share best practice in the interest of accelerating the secure and robust development of a very exciting market. I can also say, having arrived here in Sydney on Sunday morning, that I have, over the past three days, had some of the most stimulating conversations uh, around the whole area, not just social impact bonds, Andrew, but more widely around social enterprise and social investment. And I have to say, within 10 minutes' walk of this building, there is a rich pool of human capital, probably richer than many of the pools in London. Uh, and I, I really celebrate that. I probably learned more than I shared with people, so thank you for your patience and time. Um, a word of introduction on social finance. We're a social investment intermediary. We're passionate about identifying new ways of tackling entrenched social problems, but crucially ways which are both sustainable and scalable. We have no capital of our own. We live by our wits, we live by support from philanthropy, and we're li living by an increasing proportion of earned income. And as we approach our fifth birthday, we're now a team of 30 people drawn from a rich mixture of finance, public sector, and social sector. Unfortunately, um, probably only half of those are focused on social impact bonds. How do we work in practice? Well, we start, social purpose is the heart of what we do. We start with the understanding of the social issue. We, we try to reconcile some of the conflicting analysis. We talk to all the various knowledge holders in the area. And we identify where we can effective interventions to produce better outcomes. But crucially at that stage, we move on to understand how the money flows work. Where is the money spent? Where are the costs of poor outcome recorded? And then we look at different ways of moving those revenue flows around in the hope that we can identify a business model which will lead to both strong social impact, but crucially, a robust financial return. There is then a, a very important process of building investor confidence, both in the robustness of the model from a financial point of view, but also the integrity and fidelity from a social impact point of view. Hopefully, that leads to a capital raise, and that's certainly uh, what we managed to achieve around Peterborough Prison. But the next stage is doubly important. We have to do what we can to make sure that those investments deliver. We know we're at a very early stage of the development of this market, and delivery is all in terms of building future commissioner and investor confidence. <clears throat> and lastly, I very much hope we'll be part of sharing evidence with you, which will allow the delivery organizations we work with and the investors that we work with, and above all, <coughs> funders and commissioners, to learn from that and inform what they do next. If we do this well, our ambition is that we actually change the way government tackles certain key social problems. That we actually help strong and effective social enterprises grow and build their own evidence base. And that we widen access to greater pools of investors to this type of investing. We know a lot of people are talking about it. They struggle to do it. And if we get that right, there will be lasting social change. And that is essentially the pitch we make to core funders, and it excites people. So where do we sit in the market? We sit very much between the investors, and I put the investors at the top there for, for a very deliberate reason, <coughs> government and the social service providers. These different parties have very different objectives, very different to reconcile, very often speaking very different languages. I've had 25 years of experience in different forms of market, and this market is at a very raw stage, and it requires quite a lot of industrial effort to bring the providers of finance together with the potential users of finance. There is a complex relationship between investors and government. Trusts and foundations are about solving social problems, not funding government's capital deficit. Government sometimes falls into the trap of considering a conversation to be the delivery of a procurement document. And social service providers are wrestling with a new world in which some aspects are very, very close to their hearts and others are completely new. So us as a social purpose intermediary, looking at bringing these parties together constructively, protecting them against some of the more difficult parts of the market, 
But at the end of the day, recognizing we have to deliver a robust investment proposition for the capital to flow. And unless the capital flows, we're just talking to each other. So the social impact bond, the first one that we developed, came out of this thinking. Uh, and it's, it very much echoes comments that were made in the first half of this morning's session. There is a vicious cycle, particularly in, in environments like the UK with reduced resources. <clears throat> Increasing proportion are going on acute spend. The political imperative to deliver acute services means less and less is going on early intervention, which of course leads to a spiraling of negative outcomes and further pressure on acute budgets. We very much sat back and said, how do we bring forward investment to support the early intervention in the strong expectation that there would be tangible savings which would help finance a return on that investment? And so we created the social impact bond. I completely accept the uh, observation that it is not a bond. Uh, but for the purpose of this discussion, let's stick with that label. Um, this injects early finance in a way that could lead to a very positive cycle, which would free up resources from acute spend to be reinvested in early intervention. It's my hope, particularly in areas where we develop a strong evidence base very quickly, that in some ways the social impact bond becomes redundant within five or ten years. It serves a purpose at the moment for making very transparent what we're trying to do, both for government, for the social delivery organisations, some of whom who could not cope with capital on their own balance sheet, and for the investor, who is suddenly excited for the first time that there is a chance for a social outcome to directly trigger a financial return. So I think the clarity of the various roles in a social impact bond is very helpful to develop and accelerate thinking, but I very much look forward to the day when social service delivery organisations take the agenda and run with it and that some of the complexity of this financing is reduced to a much more conventional relationship between capital and organizations. So to turn to Peterborough, um, we opened for business just over two years ago. Uh, the principle was to work with about 3,000 prisoners expected to leave Peterborough prison over a six year period. Funding intervention work <laughs> on the basis that if we delivered a measurable reduction in the level of crime from a defined cohort relative to a national average, we would trigger payments from the Ministry of Justice and the big lottery. Our assessment of these prisoner needs meant that there was no single organization that could deliver across the piece. So we put in place the one service, which is a way of integrating different delivery partners in a spirit of collaboration and a unified system to measure progress, measure needs, and measure progress in delivering needs. There has been an extremely interesting insight as we develop this. What I've noticed that there is considerable value that has been generated by introducing our clients more effectively to other services that were provided in the area, which in many ways they were disconnected from. So in some ways, some of the value has not been directly related to our investment. We stimulated systemic change. The prison has changed the way they're going to work. They've actually adopted some of the practices in the women's wing. <coughs> the organizations we're working with have also risen to the challenge. For them, there's a prospect of visibility of funding way beyond a typical contract, six or seven years. We are actually, through sharing, understanding of how needs are being met and blockages, they are learning ways of innovating their own process, and I'll come on in a couple of minutes to explain how their actual delivery has changed over the last couple of years. But I hasten to add, this is not the only model. We very much take an agnostic approach to social finance. We look at the reality of the delivery landscape, and we structure the financing and the operational delivery around it. If we found one strong organization who could deliver all these services, our role will be different but there will be elements that will be consistent. We would take a very strong responsibility for two things. One is reporting, and two is governance. At the end of the day, in this early stage of the market, we are raising capital with an awful lot of trust. And if we, we have to think very carefully about how every pound is spent to ensure that both the social impact and the financial return are honored in the process. You can't hardwire the double bottom line into contracts. You have to live it in every investment decision. So 
So what did we learn? Well, something which was quite frightening is we had very little understanding of the needs of the population we were working with. And it was fascinating to build up an understanding of the first 100 prisoners that emerged. As you would expect, 20% maybe were extremely active. Another 30 might have some very entrenched issues. Another 50 wouldn't want to talk to us. But actually only through documenting precisely what the needs were and the engagement that we tried to deliver in the early stages pre-release did we build up a picture of the true service that we needed to deliver. It also became clear that engagement pre-release was absolutely critical. But what was interesting is 70% of the people we were working with wanted to engage, which actually shows the market failure. These people had no support in the previous uh, environment. We put systems in place which consistently measure progress against meeting needs. What we've learned is certain interventions correlate very strongly with a reduced propensity to reoffend. For example, if someone wants, wants to be met and is met at the gate, or if we has a housing need and we meet it, or has a low-level mental health need and we meet it, there's a material improvement in the outcome. Now, I'm not pointing at causality there. I'm just simply saying that's what the data tells us. I suspect that someone who wants to be met at the gate is already on the way to a different life. But I think by virtue of analyzing this sort of experience, we can then recycle that back into our commissioning decisions and ultimately improve the way we work as a team. What is exciting me too is the stakeholders in the area, the police, the criminal justice partnership, the mental health, public health services, and the, crucially the prison, remain excited about this project. It's now part of their long-term strategic plans. Sadly, this six, seven-year project is now one of the beacons of stability in the area at a time when many other uh, services are being cut. The lady we recruited to run the program was very clear to us the thing that drew her to working in this way was the money was flexible. It was not prescribed according to a number of KPIs or SLAs. It was money that could respond to the needs of the people that we met and assessed as they released for release from prison. And that power of the project, I think, is something never to be forgotten. There is also a very simple thing, which is doing simple things well and consistently is actually quite difficult and requires quite a lot of innovation. But I think we've seen real value in terms of increasing our engagement with prisoners pre-release, assessing their needs, and actually updating those needs, because the needs of someone just on the eve of release are very different from the needs that they acknowledge when they've been uh, in the community for, for a month or so. What do we need to do differently? Well, one of the things we found very difficult is that as, as caseworkers develop close working relationships with individual clients, particularly around that moment post-release when they deliver on housing, when they deliver on access to benefits and maybe uh, drug treatment, that relationship goes very deep and is very difficult to migrate. And in terms of the resources and the scarce resources, we have to migrate people to a volunteer support networks within a matter of four months. So we've looked at, with lower risk, lower need prisoners, bringing volunteers much earlier into the process and the triage. And that's led to a very constructive relationship with the full-time caseworkers, whereby there's a handoff that occurs pre-release and the volunteer relationship can revolve around those immediate events post-release. We've also, I think, been very comfortable or very uh, pleased with the way we've been able to meet some of the short-term needs, but the longer-term journey back to employment, back to a more resilient lifestyle, is one of the big conundrums. We're looking at all sorts of ways of deepening our support around motivation, around conflict resolution, but this, as I see it, is the real priority for the next phase of the project is to go very deep in this area. But this is precisely the value of this way of working. We have six years to constantly innovate and draw in learning. And I hope at the end of the process have something we're very proud to show. Um, I mentioned data. It lies at the heart of what we're doing. But this is data that the delivery organizations own. They collect it, they input it, they understand it, they design the schedules that we produce. But it invite, provides a very rich agenda for a whole series of questions. We can identify, for example, when the prison is probably making it difficult to get into a particular <coughs> wing, because you can see underperformance developing in certain areas of activity. 
Equally well, we can see where needs are being expressed but very poorly met, which can then inform the commissioning decision. We brought, brought on recently a much more intensive uh, low-level mental health support because it was an area where we were clearly failing. And as I said earlier, we can actually begin to identify where certain events seem to correlate strongly with a lower propensity to reoffend. Fortunately, we moved on in terms of other areas of application. We're delighted that we're on the verge of a project at Essex County Council to uh, work with adolescents on the age of care. We won two contracts recently in the Welfare to Work Agenda, part of the DWP Innovation Fund. Together, both of these have required us to raise a further £5 million, which we've managed to, to secure. Um, there is also ongoing a further uh, activity in the uh, rehabilitation of prisoners where we're advising two consortia. What's increasingly emerging is that government is reaching out to us to help them look at ways in which they could design metrics and analyse costs. So some of our activities and some of our earned revenue is now through consulting work. Some of the frustrations are that if we sit too closely with government, we cannot then, through procurement rules, come round and raise the capital on the other side. And therefore, we're as exposed as the rest of us to a weak market where investors are lost without some of the intermediation skills that we can bring. Nevertheless, we feel that for government to put contracts that are sufficiently savvy in how the market works is actually a way of accelerating the development of a deeper market. Uh, we're also working around the issue of rough sleeping. Now, interestingly enough, in the homelessness case, the Greater London Authority is not focused on cashable savings. They've identified £5 million as a desirable amount of money to spend so long as a desirable outcome is achieved. They realise that actually effective delivery and risk transfer is, is as important a rationale for this type of working as, as simply cashable savings. What's exciting is that following Peterborough, the, the, this way of working has become a legitimate policy tool. I'm aware through a recent report of 28 different initiatives in, uh, throughout the UK. Some of them are tiny, but there's a way of working here, a way of thinking about costs and outcomes, which is extremely exciting. But as you know, this is now a very international dialogue. I was absolutely stunned why a £5 million transaction for a prison 80 miles north of London should cause quite the excitement that it did. We were inundated with inquiry. A lot of people were, were convinced that they were on the verge of a new revolution in a matter of months. <laughs> this is a marathon, not a sprint. And what is interesting is that certainly New South Wales and probably Canada emerge as the two areas of the world where we saw sustained thinking and, and, and a real focus on the challenge. And I'm delighted to be part of the debate here. I'm very much looking forward to the completion of the process. What we're seeing is that in certain countries, the mover is, is to some extent a very large foundation. That's certainly the case in Canada. It's also the case in Germany. Uh, in the US, we clearly can come back to discuss one or two aspects of the models emerging there, but there became a very strong political driver to see this new way of working. We very fortunately have been supported by a foundation um, to employ Jane Newman to, to help in a collaborative way develop this market. We have a self-interest. We want robust SIBs to emerge in other jurisdictions. Only then do we develop perhaps the investor confidence we need to take this market to the next stage. We're also looking at the uh, scope to uh, use development impact partnerships, development impact bonds in the emerging market arena, in the developing market. Uh, there's a very great deal of interest amongst multilaterals and aid donors around whether effectiveness of delivery, innovation, and risk transfer have a role to play. And we're looking at projects around the elimination of sleeping sickness and some of the issues around education in Africa. But as Peter Shergold rightly said, there are a number of challenges in building this market. This, in a uh, simplified way, is, is the shall I say, the criteria, the rather demanding set of criteria, I think you need to have in place to identify whether a SIB has a chance of running. You need a robust outcome metric. It needs to be something you can write down in a contract. It needs to have within it a clear thought about any perverse incentives that might arise around delivery of that impact. 
there needs to be a clearly defined target group. Very often people are aware that there's a very large target group, a large at risk cohort, for whom the likelihood of an outcome is certainly poor, but maybe not a large proportion of them will suffer from that outcome. It's very difficult to spend a meaningful amount of money on a very large cohort. So focusing very clearly on your risk cohort is important. The cost of the intervention has to be relatively small against the outcome, uh, the public value of the outcome that's desired. That will come through in the modelling, but it's one of those things that really clearly gets lost early in the process in a number of pieces of analysis. You need evidence-based interventions. One of the things that I'm absolutely passionate about is I cannot go to an investor and ask them to take a risk which hasn't been analysed as far as we possibly can. They cannot take a flyer, and nor should the commissioner take a flyer. They should, and, and the investor, have a common interest in making sure what is being designed has a good chance of delivering. And as Peter said, attribution. This is a really tough one. It's the government has an interest in only paying for outcomes that are delivered by the intervention. Equally well, the investor wants to be rewarded properly if they deliver value. And this is the conundrum which I find probably takes up most of the civil development time in our experience. Last but not least, it has to be an issue area that's a priority for the public sector because it's hard yards, it takes a lot of work. But equally, I can't raise money unless it excites investors. There are a number of projects that are put on the table which really I cannot see an investor finding exciting. They see this as a working capital requirement or some form of risk which really government ought to take. But of all those, I think the bottom two are the biggest gating items. If we actually have clarity on those two or momentum on both those two, then I suspect a lot of the other issues are open to being solved in the right constructive environment. I've highlighted uh, five challenges here, and I'll dig into a couple of them more deeply in a minute, but um, procurement is a real challenge in this market. It's more complicated in the UK because of the EU dimension. I've heard the comments about New South Wales, and one sounds wonderfully free, uh, the environment in which you can work. But at the end of the day, both investors and commissioners lack information about what, a, what is the likelihood of an effective delivery. And what we find is that the cost of the procurement process is a massive strain on investor patients and on the intermediary resources. It typically takes us two years to develop a social impact bond from start. Um, there's also the case in a number of very important social issue areas, the savings actually accrue to multiple departments. And there's a very exciting initiative afoot in the UK to look at dealing with that. We do need to grow the investor community. We excited people around Peterborough. Foundations that have funded criminal justice in a very frustrating way and seen programs abandoned after a few months, a few years, suddenly saw a new way of something that was very close to their hearts being funded on a sustainable basis. So they were up for support. We drew in high net worths who were excited by this way of working, who'd been frustrated in their own philanthropy about some of the ineffectiveness of the work they've been doing. They, they may not have understood criminal justice, but they understood they were in the same syndicate alongside some of the real experts. We need to go beyond philanthropy in order to make this a, a, a sustainable market. It also, as a market, needs to professionalise, insofar as it's quite tough to be part of a procurement exercise, and it's certainly not what a grant maker at a foundation gets up every morning to do. Um, and lastly, the service providers, the strong ones are responding very positively. They know the importance of being able to evidence, but we're putting that evidence through a much higher standard of rigour than perhaps has ever been done before. Touching on procurement, it, it, it is a very uh, inexperienced market. It lacks data. What does that mean? Well, it means the delivery organisation has a bias to be optimistic. If you actually believe you're more likely to deliver an outcome, you require less compensation per outcome. And government in straightened times is quite tempted to go with the lowest price. But what do you have there? You have and it, a, a, a transaction which may not deliver, it probably won't deliver anything like the promise, may lead to frustrated investors, may lead to frail intervention, and worse still, a collapsed intervention, and will set the market back. So I think procurement has to recognize its role in building this market by paying respectively for well thought through, well evidenced, and risk tested interventions. The process is very tough. 
I mean, certainly, I don't think in a number of cases any of our investors would have participated if we hadn't existed. And we have burned the midnight oil on too many occasions. There has to be a way in which this becomes simpler. And last but not least, I think government has to respect that the only reason that a lot of these investors come to the table is because there is the delegated authority to deliver a genuine social impact. They cannot just expect the money to come and finance the capital deficit they've required. So the sense in which we provide a role challenging government before they go to market, I think, has been well valued in the UK. But I'm hoping that as we develop interventions across a wide range of issue areas, this level of confidence in this way of working builds exponentially. Another issue which um, the government has struggled with is how do they assess the value of risk transfer? A number of times when I talk about the likely return on SIBs and we talk 7%, we talk 12%, the immediate reaction is that the risk-free rate is 3%. How do I justify the idea of paying someone else anything like that return for delivering the service? Well, a large part of the answer is you don't pay if it isn't successful. But that doesn't actually fit into a number of uh, forms of analysis that government works with. And at the end of the day, there's a second piece here, which is I think the accountability and the focus of handing the responsibility to a SIB is that you're more likely to deliver the positive outcome. So it's not only that you, 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 you may be able to share the benefits, but you're more likely to be able to share the benefits. There's an interesting example. There was a, in the early 2000s, there was a Ministry of Justice exercise which administered about two or 300 million pounds to six pilots doing exactly the same thing across the UK. Two produced stunning results. Two produced almost immeasurable, uh, unidentifiable impact. And some actually led to perverse outcomes. Well, in that analysis, they would have only paid for the two that were successful. But I think what this says to me is that people have to understand the value of strong implementation. Rehabilitation and troubled families where poor outcomes lead to very high costs but spread across a number of different areas. Uh, excitingly, I think government in the UK has acknowledged this and is looking, and I think you may hear more about this uh, later, at the idea of a central outcomes fund, which would actually top up outcome payments from individual commissioning bodies. I think this would also bring to the table much more experience procurement expertise, more experience around assessment of value for money, and lead to a very strong emphasis on capacity building throughout government. So a relatively small amount of money, which would probably only pay a minority of the outcomes costs, could have a very important flywheel effect in the UK. <coughs> but turning to the investors, I mentioned that we need to move on from the trusts and foundations, but for the moment, they are an extremely engaged group. My sense and where we get a lot of traction is not when government asks them to respond, but when we go and research a social issue, identify a new way of working in an issue which they care about deeply and take the solution to government. And government at that point becomes a partner in solving the solution. That is the, um, the, the sweet spot in terms of the current market for investor interest. So the work we're doing with adolescents on the edge of care in Essex, that was oversubscribed. Um, high net worths are keen to get involved and we think the scope to bring in the mass affluent and the particular wrapper for that would be to use existing tax incentives in the UK which are there for small medium enterprises, the venture capital trust is the technical phrase or the EIS which would actually bring quite a significant tax incentive to invest in this way and certainly our experience talking with the IFAs is that the typical risk bucket in an investor portfolio for this type of investment is very high. And this sort of social impact resonance could be very powerful. We're also looking at, through um, part of social finance, providing an investor as advisory service to uh, the foundations. They, at different stages, recognize they don't have the competence in hand to implement these transactions. They feel passionate about mission. At the end of the day, they will never hand over the money unless they're comfortable the mission is being delivered. But there's an awful lot of work around this, around implementing the investment, managing the investment, reporting on it, which we can take off their shoulders. And we, I think, need to think through ways in which we can actually make, recognizing some of the challenges this money has in terms of getting it to move, how we can support the infrastructure to make a difference. I'm very excited by some of the conversations I've had here about how close you seem to be to 
some of the institutional investors, and I've always known that the Australian supers are more broad in some of the objectives that they're prepared to support. London is one of the most difficult markets from an institutional point of view. Uh, I was very interested when we were launching Peterborough, I got a call on the first day from a chief, a chief investment officer of a pension fund who said, I want to be the first to invest in this. And I was somewhat taken aback because I hadn't expected this type of call. But we spent time on the phone with his actuary, and when I explained he could lose all his money, it was quite clear where that conversation was going to go. <laughs> but I did have the opportunity to talk to the actuary. I said, well, what would it be that would make the difference here? And he said, well, clearly, if you could guarantee principle, that would make a dramatic difference to the risk profile in the, in the portfolio. If you could show me a, a portfolio of social impact bonds, where there's diversification of risk, that would make a difference. And if you've got evidence of delivery, that would make a difference. Not rocket science, but very helpful to get that type of uh, guidance. Another conversation I had was with the local authority pension fund. He said, David, if you could get four or five of these SIBs in a portfolio, let's say 20 million would be the minimum, and you could show me they were delivering, I would buy them in the secondary market. So I can then talk to trusts and foundations about an earlier exit for that capital on the basis they don't have to stay the course to the final payment date. In the UK, we have a, an extraordinary bit of the jigsaw, which is big society capital. Uh, I think a large part of the reason that the 450 million of dormant accounts was devoted towards social investment was central government excitement about social impact bonds. We now have to bring that to life. What is happening in the UK is a number of funds are being seeded, uh, which will have a broader remit, much broader than social impact bonds, but for whom social impact bonds become an important part of their portfolio. That will, I hope, and I, I'm sure, will accelerate the professionalization of the market. It makes it so much easier for us as, as an intermediary to know we have a partner who's able to engage in quite a sophisticated type of discussion at short notice at strange hours of the day in order to get some of these contracts delivered. What well, the emerging models, right? if you take Peterborough as, as really version 1.0, we have taken all the risk. Uh, now, that is partly the excitement of taking a solution to government, and if we ask government in any way to underpin certain risks, I'm absolutely certain we wouldn't have got the contract signed. And as I say, the investor excitement around this new way of working meant that we were able to raise the money from 17 foundations. Um, what we're seeing in the next generation in the UK is people are predicating the early outcome payments to fund service delivery. So, if you like, you're reducing the capital requirement of, sort of uh, supporting one particular contract, but you're leveraging the, uh, uh, the capital quite extensively. And you're also uh, not necessarily fully funding the program. Now, there are reputational risks around that which you know, are worth thinking about, but that is one of the pressures. And the reason that the contract goes that way is partly the supply of investment, but it's also a perception within the public sector that they hate the cost of outcome payments when they're delayed for many years. In, in pounds, million, Aussie dollar, million, it looks a lot of money. And therefore, they're very keen, if you like, to get money to flow sooner because in the simple maths of return, that reduces the headline amount of money. I think more constructively, we need to look at what I call structured risk share. I mean, there is value for government in this service being provided. What they're keen to do is make sure that there is a very clear incentive on the providers of capital to deliver the positive outcome. So there is a discussion to be had about whether being available to deliver an availability payment, if you like, is something that's a legitimate way of using public funds, perhaps to reward no more than the risk-free rate, or perhaps even less than the risk-free rate, with the real purpose of the investment being triggering an outcome payment in which there's much more risk. And my sense is that some of those structures, certainly when we're looking at the, the developing markets, that's the way the market will move. You don't lose the accountability that the investment process brings, and you definitely provide the incentives for innovation. Uh, but you do perhaps provide a market which is going to grow more rapidly. And then you get closer to what, to what I would call a social impact bond, i.e. that there is a core level of return which is relatively certain. And I could see these being described as bonds, and when you get to the challenge of introducing these to portfolios, we have to talk the language of a portfolio manager. And they have bond funds. They don't have limited partnership funds in anything like the same way. So those are my thoughts. I think we are at an extremely exciting moment. We're lucky, as an intermediary, that we've been supported by D 
deep philanthropy, the big lottery in particular, transformed our organization when we got a multi-year grant about two years ago. We got one more year of that. It allowed us to hire some extremely exciting human capital. And I know that the investors and government and social sector organizations get so much further because we exist. But at the end of the day, we're about the social purpose. And above all, if we don't get money to move, as I said earlier, we're just talking to each other.